What is going on world? What's up YouTube? It's Zero here. Today I'm bringing you guys a brand new episode of the 8 Below Show. Welcome everyone to 8 Below. Thanks for being here everyone. And in today's episode we have a ton of stuff to talk about. So let's get into it. Our first topic of the day is going to be talking about Nurchio and Makers, a team that, and player, of course, obviously former at this point, that obviously there was some tension. There were things going on between organization and player that obviously didn't really work out. And it seems that Nurchio, we may obviously talked about this in a previous episode of the 8 Below Show, Nurchio claiming that he had not been paid by Makers, the esports organization, then of course replied stating, you know, kind of making up all these weird like excuses and basically stating that the players need to be more responsible of showing them receipts and things of that nature to be able to get paid. Very weird back and forth. Well, anyways, we spoke about that. We kind of reported on it, talked about it. So I figured why not finish this this topic, right? And kind of give you the conclusion of kind of what happened and or is it really actually a conclusion at this point? Because Arthur Block, uh, also known as Nurchio, went ahead and tweeted out saying, I would like to inform you about the situation to the problem of missing salary from, ma from Maker's team. As a result of talks between lawyers, the money is in my account and I consider this matter so far to be resolved. Period. So, right there guys, it looks like Nurchio is stating that he got his money. He got the money that was owed to him, and I think Makers obviously owed, obviously owed him money, right? He got the money, and he says, so far, it's resolved. Well, Makers went ahead, and they posted a tweet uh, stating, following Mr. Block's latest statements. And if you click on this tweet longer, it brings you to a... Uh, a, a post, a statement in which reads, following Mr. Block's latest statements, we are forced to once again speak about this matter in order to provide a precise and correct reconstruction of the facts. In his latest tweet, Mr. Block has forgotten to mention that the amounts paid to him correspond to what Makers has always considered the player was entitled to. To arrive at a solution, we required the consultancy of lawyers who determined that Mr. Block's initial demands did not correspond in the contract agreement signed by both parties. It is yet another distorted representation of the facts from Mr. Block to damage our company. Once again, we would like to reiterate how a wrong and damaging use of social media can be prejudicial not only our company, but the whole sector, because we are passionate about this game and sector into which we put all our effort and dedicate all our time. We are displeased to turn a meaningful one-year growth experience, which involved other players and a whole support staff, into a negative episode. Makers was one of the organizations which invested the most in 2019 in this game and in doing so, achieving great results. Despite this unpleasant event, Makers will continue to represent and promote StarCraft II in the future. So I think what Makers is saying here is that uh, Nurchio stated that he considered the matter to be resolved and the money's in his account. Basically, essentially kind of giving us the hint or the idea that Makers was in the wrong and they paid him because they were wrong and it's like, okay, like we got we to get on this and we got to do this and uh, because we don't want to get called out on on social media again. And he, did, uh, he didn't necessarily state that, um, you know, you know, any wrongdoings once again. He just basically said that he got his money and it was resolved. Uh, so I see where Makers is coming from, which basically saying like that, uh, you know, they don't like the way that he presented it on social media. And I understand that, but I don't think that our, that Nurchio is trying to damage the company more as Makers is making it sound like. They got a lot of backlash on this as well, that, that this post a lot of people just staying like, stop talking, Makers. Stop making statements. Just kind of move on. This has already been resolved. Just move on. And they are, they're they having a tough time doing that. I see both sides of it, right? I see like, look, just don't even... Okay, it's like, look, it's taken care of. Let's just move forward. But with a, t a team like Makers that's still trying to make a name for themselves, they have sponsors and things of that nature and probably investors involved as well. They're probably stating, look, like they're probably getting pressure from those people 
to make a statement to basically try to, you know, kind of represent the facts, right? Uh, as far as their facts uh, to this entire situation. So I see it both ways, guys. I don't know. I mean, I think that Nurcio was just give, keeping us all informed as to, you know, that he got paid and that everything's good now. Makers is just kind of, uh, I don't know. They're, they want to rep, they want their company represented in a certain way, which is certainly you want to, you definitely want, you know, those things to be, you know, um, taken care of behind closed doors more likely than not. And I mean, sometimes though, it seems like players have to come up with ways in which to get their money that they are, they're owed. And Makers is, uh, you know, just a t another team that is kind of caught in that crossfire between players and fans and, and, and all of that. So I, I, I don't know if they're, you know, I'm swaying towards one side or another. Obviously, it seems like Nurcio getting his money and all of that is basically stating that Makers was in the wrong and that they did pay him the debts that were owed. Um, but, you know, I, I do, th I kind of see both sides of it, really. But I would love to hear from you guys. What do you guys think about this? Whose side are you on? Do you see both sides of the story or situation kind of like myself? What do you guys think? Let me know in the comment section below. Our next topic of the day is about GTA 6, guys, a franchise, a game that has been long awaited and people are very excited about, but there's a number of questions that are coming up as to where is GTA 6 at this point. Grand Theft Auto, you know, has had a history, of course, of coming out with games, or I should say Rockstar games, coming out with GTA games, you know, regularly. I mean, I wouldn't say like, you know, it's obviously not every year like Call of Duty, but usually they take their time with the game, it comes out maybe every five years, sometimes maybe even 10 years, depending on which IP you're talking about here. Well, of course we've had GTA 5 and we've had it for a long time. Lots of people want to see continuations of that storyline. Others just want to see new storylines re revolving around, you know, Grand Theft Auto. So I guess the big question is, is where is Grand Theft Auto 6 at this point? So let's talk about it. So in an article that was written uh, by a PC Gamer, GTA 6 and all the rumblings about the setting, the release date, and things of that nature, Rockstar has sold nearly 110 million copies of GTA 5, so a follow-up seems inevitable. With Red Dead Redemption 2 coming to PC, we're looking ahead to Rockstar's next move, which will surely be GTA 6. Given that Rockstar's recent blockbuster games tend to land four to five years apart, that puts a GTA 6 release date at 2022 or 2023, assuming GTA 6 is the next proje project and not Rockstar Table Tennis 2. First of all, I don't think Rockstar was would be working on Table Tennis 2. I'm pretty sure they would have been working on Bully 2 or Max Payne 4, or even L.A. Noir 2. Um, I think that those would be have a much better chance at seeing the light of day than Table Tennis 2. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, guys, uh, you know, I, I do think that GTA 6 is probably going to be the next thing. Um, but, I mean, really, they're making so much money off of, you know, off of GTA 5 at this point still to this day that, I mean, they could probably just keep milking GTA 5 uh, for the foreseeable future. That will be well into the next console gener generation, so chances are Rockstar is developing their next big game for powerful future tech. At the moment, there are very few specifics out there, but the Housers and other Rockstar devs have spoken in roundabout terms about the GTA series generally. Maybe we can get teas out of a few clues. So what evidence is there that GTA 6 is in the works? It seems that the game definitely exists in some form. Recently, GTA 6 was listed on an artist's resume working out of India. Rockstar has acquired another large studio in India from struggling Starbreeze, which suggests that Rockstar is staffing up on art resources for its next big game. A seemingly official in-game announcement saying that GTA 6 was due out in 2019 turned out to be fake, however. And see, here's the thing. There's been a ton of leaks for GTA 6, but there's also been a lot of leaks for Bully 2. Now, obviously, Rockstar could be working on two projects at once. Um, you know, that would be kind of surprising because they usually just work on one project at a time. But at the same time, I mean, maybe they're working on two different games because there's been a lot of leaks for both of these games. Rockstar's UK tax relief filing points to possible GTA 6 development. Tax Watch. 
a UK-based investigative think tank that monitors that monitors and reports on the taxation situations of large companies and wealthy individuals in the country recently called out Rockstar for its overly large tax relief filings. Aside, um, f- aside from the claims that Rockstar is taking advantage of a tax program meant to benefit smaller companies. TaxWatch report also speculates that a new Grand Theft Auto game is in the works, stating that uh, the huge claims being put in by Rockstar are likely related to the production costs of GTA 6. It's certainly no confirmation, but it pretty much goes without saying that Rockstar is probably dumping, dumping a healthy amount of cash into developing the next game in its Mammoth series. I would agree with that. What will be the what will the setting be for GTA 6? Beyond a release date, the most important thing we want to know is where and when GTA 6 will be set. Everything flows from Rockstar's choice of city and decade. GTA 5's return to Los Angeles sets us up for a return to Vice City. In an interview with Develop, uh, Develop in 2013, president of Rockstar North Leslie Benzies referred again to Rockstar's trifecta of preferred GTA cities. We don't know what GTA 6 will be, but we've got some ideas. We've got about 45 years' worth of ideas we want to do. We'll pick the right ones. It comes from the idea first. Where it is going to be set is the first question. That then defines the missions. You're doing different things in LA than in New York or Miami. The map and story get worked up together, and the story is a basic flow of how it works out so you can layer the mission in. Speaking of old GTA cities, a few years ago, a Liberty City scene appeared on a Rockstar Devs profile, apparently mocked up in GTA 5's engine. This could easily have been a technical test or perhaps a scene from some scrapped uh, single-player DLC, but Rockstar once talked about putting all of their cities into one mega game. That sounds absurdly ambitious, but Rockstar might well have the resources to do it. Alternatively, back in 2013, Dan Hauser suggested that there's still some interest in London as a setting, even if it doesn't end up being part of the Grand Theft Auto series. Speaking to The Guardian, Hauser said, I think for us, my gut feeling is GTA London was cool for the time, but games were more limited then. These days, I think we would love to set a game in the UK, set in London, whatever, but I don't know if it would be a GTA game. I think there are plenty of great stories we could tell about the UK, great environments to showcase great gameplay mechanics that could have a UK bent to them. I just don't think it would be a GTA necessarily. So what I'm going to say, guys, is as far as the setting goes, Personally, I I like what Rockstar does with like having new stories to tell within the GTA universe. So I mean, you you can kind of look at pretty much all the different games, right? They don't really a lot of the games don't follow a similar narrative, um, or you know, kind of f- they're not really continuations of one another. So like GTA Four, when you had Nico, obviously the story kind of changed. Obviously, when we got to GTA Five. And, you know, so on and so forth. So I think what they should do is they should continue changing things up. And I would like to see, like, a, I guess all the games or all the cities, like, put into one game and, like, just make a massive game. I mean, that would be really cool. I really do wonder what they're thinking for GTA 6. Um, obviously, it's, it's almost like, yeah, why get too ambitious? Because... Even though I would love to see that, it's almost like, why would they need to do that? They just need to continue the story, update, you know, have updated graphics as we go. And obviously, this is such a beloved franchise that it's going to get, it's going to sell. It's going to do really well. So it's one of those things, guys. I don't know. We'll have to kind of wait and see what ends up happening there and where, you know, the time period that they go. And if they try to make like, you know, put all the games kind of together into one, you know, universe, so to speak, uh, that would be really interesting. Um, or I guess you could like, you know, almost put everything into the same eras and, you know, all of that. It, there's a lot of ways they could go about doing it. Who really knows? All of which is to say, who knows, like I just said. In another interview, Hauser opened up the possibility that a new GTA could be quite different in tone and setting to previous entries. Though it's hard to imagine the series moving away from the USA. I I agree with that. Um, I don't think it's going to move away from uh, the USA. I I just don't. Um, 
other than that, guys, it, you know, we have an anonymous Reddit post oddly cites one of our writers as a source. If we knew what GTA 6 was, we'd tell you. That post suggests that GTA 6 is codenamed Project Americas and will be set in Vice City and a new city based on Rio de Janeiro. It's rumored to be set between 1970 and 1980, and the main character is mixed up with the drug trade. The game may feature drug empire mechanics inspired by Vice City. This rumor claims that Netflix's Narcos is a major inspiration, and your car will behave like Red Dead Redemption 2's horse in that it serves a mobile storage as well as transport. Visually, the game will be more stylized uh, th than the photorealistic Red Dead Redemption 2, and characters will speak in their native language with subtitles. So, I I like the I, I like the idea of kind of the drug trade. I think that would make for a really I mean it's a to totally Grand Theft Auto. I mean obviously it's it, that, that that would be such a Grand Theft Auto type thing to do. Um, I with Red Red, Red Dead Redemption Two. I loved Red Dead Redemption Two. I think it's a it's a great game. Um, overall, I think the graphics are incredible for that size of a game. That's what I'm excited for with GTA 6, seeing what the graphics look like when you're talking about just how, you know, massive this game could be, but how great the graphics could be. And I think kind of taking that, uh, that approach, like, like Narcos, I, I watched that show and that's a, I mean, it's a great show. And I think having Vice City kind of going back to the Vice City days, that would be really, really cool. So it doesn't. Uh, it does seem likely that there will be at least a little bit of, of crime in GTA 6. Our money is on Vice City with an expanded version of GTA Online, which has been remarkably successful for GTA 5. Whatever GTA 6 is, hopefully we'll see it release uh, PC alongside consoles this time. And I agree with that. And so here's what I'm saying, guys, or what I kind of think. Where's GTA 6? So. We're kind of, you know, obviously it looks like it's definitely being uh, developed at this point, whether that's the early stages or not. My thought process is, is that it's probably going to get announced this year or maybe, you know, sometime next year. So I would say we're about a year to two years away from an announcement and we're probably about another year or so after that to actually receive the game and be able to start playing it. So I would say we're probably, most likely, we're going to see, I, I would think, an announcement probably this year, and then we won't see the game for a couple of years after that. That would just be like kind of my thought process on it. Um, but I do think it's being developed. I think it's being developed with maybe Bully 2 or like a Max Payne 4, even maybe a L.A. Noir 2. It's hard to say which other game they're working on, but GTA, it's like, why wouldn't they be making another GTA? So I think they are definitely working on it. Um, and I think we're probably going to see it in, of, of course, like probably uh, the next couple of years. But I would love to hear from you guys. When do you guys think we'll see GTA 6? What do you want to see the most? Do you want to see Vice City? Do you want to see something futuristic? What is it that you want to see out of the next Grand Theft Auto edition? Let me know what you guys think in the comment section below. Our next topic on the show is going to be talking about Call of Duty and Sony or PlayStation and their partnership and... Is there going to be those exclusivity rights uh, between Call of Duty and PlayStation 5 as the PlayStation 5 does approach us? Is there going to be that, that, you know, that deal that the Call of Duty League is going to be played specifically on the PlayStation 5? So let's talk about it. So guys, I, I think that something I've been wanting to kind of talk about is obviously... PlayStation has had the rights to the Call of Duty League or the Call of Duty World League previously for a number of years now, right? So Xbox had it, and then it's kind of gone back and forth a little bit. And now we've got PlayStation that owns those rights to the Call of Duty League. And so will moving into the PlayStation 5 after it was announced, so we, we PlayStation 5 has been announced, right? It's coming holiday of 2020. So the question is, is when the next Call of Duty comes out, which is a, uh, allegedly Call of Duty Black Ops 5, when that comes out, are we going to see the deal continue with the Call of Duty League with PlayStation moving forward into the future? And here's why I think that is not going to happen. And I'm, I'm going to pass this question on to all of you out there uh, here in a moment. But that being said, right now, what I think, guys, is that the Call of Duty League is trying to get its grounding. It's kind of trying to get its, its feel and kind of obviously the structure, right? I believe, though, that what they're thinking over at Activision, 
at this point with Call of Duty is that eventually they want to expand it to not just PlayStation, but maybe to Xbox as well as to PC as far as the Call of Duty League is concerned so that anyone can be competing on whatever they want to compete on. And I think that that is something that may happen in the future with Call of Duty. Now, maybe not directly, not maybe, maybe not immediately it happens, but I think that them putting it specifically or exclusively on, on PlayStation is kind of limiting those people, the, the, the up and comers to playing it, especially if you've been playing on PC for years or you're an Xbox person. I feel that they're going to have that cross play uh, set up and they're trying it out obviously with Modern Warfare, not with the Call of Duty League, but just at large, Call of Duty at large with, with Modern Warfare. And then moving into the next Black Ops title, I think that we might actually start seeing Xbox, PlayStation, and PC all being accepted within the Call of Duty League. And so I think that would actually be a really, really good idea for Activision to do because, of course, it's going to attract more and more gamers from across the world. It's not just going to be, you know, mainly in the U.S. and somewhat in Europe. It's going to be mainly all over, right? It's going to be, you're going to be seeing Korea and China and other places play Call of Duty because all of, you know, all of a lot of those other countries like in China and Korea especially are playing on PC. That's what they play. So you look at Overwatch. Overwatch is becoming a worldwide esport because it's it's all on PC and you just kind of you can see that it's it's growing and growing in popularity every year. Well, Call of Duty, I think, has the potential with the Call of Duty League itself to get that to be that size, to be that big, that big of a juggernaut of an esport. But I think it's held back by only being exclusive to PlayStation. And not everyone out, you know, across the world has consoles. A lot of places, most people have PCs, but not everybody has a console. And uh, now most people here in the U.S. do. I just think that this would be a very good idea, though, for Activision to expand it to pretty much anything. And now, obviously, that would have its set of circumstances and challenges as you go. But that's, you know, kind of setting up the future of Call of Duty, the future of the Call of Duty League. You ex are accepting that there is cross-play and things of that nature, but you're also you're also going to accept the cross-play in uh, the esports realm and the Call of Duty League itself. I think that's a really good idea personally uh, because then you would have just so much more competition coming in from across the world instead of mainly in the United States and somewhat in Europe. But I could be wrong, guys, about that. And obviously, the, the Call of Duty League may, may think we're just going to continue our partnership with PlayStation. It's going to go on to the PlayStation 5. And, you know, for the foreseeable future, we're going to stay on PlayStation because it's a bigger console than Xbox. Now, if you were to say they're not going to go to PC as far as the Call of Duty League's concerned, we're going to stick with either, you know, PlayStation or Xbox. Which one are we going to go with? Most likely they're going to go with PlayStation because there's just a, it has a much bigger uh, base of players than Xbox. I just think, though, that if you have both Xbox and PlayStation, and especially PC as well, but at least Xbox and PlayStation, you have those two, your eSport is going to be even bigger than it was before. It's going to grow and grow and grow, and uh, you add PCs to that. Uh, it, it could be absolutely massive. I mean, you're, you're talking going from a... North American esport to a worldwide esport. Um, and that's what I know what we're hoping for in the Call of Duty League to get to that point eventually. But one step at a time, and I, I would love to hear from all of you guys, with the PlayStation 5 announcement, is Call of Duty League going to be exclusive to PlayStation 5 or is it going to be PlayStation 5, Xbox One X, and PC? Let me know what you guys all think. I would love to have a conversation about it. Our next topic is about Inception, guys. One of my favorite movies of all time. Absolutely love this movie. It was incredible. It was it was gritty. It was suspenseful. It was very psychological. Many different kind of endless boundaries, I guess you could say, as far as this, this movie entailed and what the potential could be. So now today I want to talk about where is Inception 2? Because, of course, with the recent announcement of Tenet, which is, of course, Christopher Nolan's next movie. There's been talk of it being a sequel to Inception or a possible you know, sequel to Interstellar, which is another one of Christopher Nolan's movies. 
I want to talk about where is Inception 2 and could it ever see the light of day at some point or another in the future. So let's talk about it. In an article that was uh, written by Looper, uh, why we never got to see an Inception sequel. So there's a number of reasons here why they why they kind of think that we never got a sequel, at least as of yet. And I'll give you guys some of my feedback as well. And I would love to hear your feedback as well. So let me know in the comment section below. Given its conceptual boundlessness, boundlessness many audiences hoped Christopher Nolan's Oscar-winning Inception would would spawn a full-on franchise. After all, didn't Tom Hardy's character tell us all not to be afraid to dream a little bigger, darling? The curveball, or should we say spinning top, ending left a lot of viewers hoping for some real resolution by way of a follow-up film. But it just hasn't happened yet. Here's why we haven't seen an Inception sequel. Inception was released right before The Dark Knight Rises closed out Nolan's three-part trek through Gotham City. Although he wasn't traditionally a sequel man before, his Dark Knight trilogy seemed to change his tune. In fact, he told Deadline in 2011 that while he did conceive of Inception as a one-shot cinematic experience, he wouldn't close the door on a possible return simply because of the outcome of his Batman experience. I've always liked the potential of the world. It's an infinite or... Perhaps I should say infin uh, infinitesimal world that fascinates me, said Nolan. I think of Inception as one film, but that's how I approach all of my films. When I was making Batman Begins, I certainly didn't have any thoughts of doing a second Batman film, let alone a third. You never quite know where your creative interests are going to take you, but when I was making Inception, I viewed it as a standalone movie. So right there, he kind of viewed it as a standalone, but at the same time, he was open to the potential of a sequel. So we got to keep that in mind as well. To further explore the dream within a dream world he created, Nolan originally eyed a video game follow-up. He told Entertainment Weekly, I always imagined Inception to be a world where a lot of other stories could take place. At the moment, the only direction we're channeling that is by developing a video game set in the world, adding that it was a longer-term proposition. He further elaborated during a 2010 press conference that the reason a video game might be his preferred medium for a new Inception story is that the platform would offer an even more expansive place for storytelling. Indeed, the multitude of layers that the dream world offered were teasingly underexplored, and many of the sequels Sequences had a gamer-esque quality like the almost mi Minecraft-ish nature of the world's building in the lowest level limbo and the ultraviolet golden eye style attack on the snow fortress. So maybe there was something to the idea. As of 2016 though, there's been no news of progress on an Inception game. So an Inception video game would be very interesting, and that's something that I would absolutely love to see. I think that, yeah, there's so many different ideas there. Now, usually when video games um, are made from movies, a lot of times they're okay, but they're not great. Usually when it's a movie that is being made or adapted from a video game, it's usually not very good at all. But in this case, I think that there would be some opportunity there to make a pretty cool story uh, in Inception, but I'd rather see a movie rather than a game, and that's just me personally. For many, the final scene of Inception was completely confusing and open-ended. In the last few moments, Leonardo DiCaprio's cop completed his mission to put the idea of dissolving an international energy company before it achieved a global monopoly into its heir's head. Then he went into the depths of cerebral chaos to retrieve his benefactor before he could forget his promise to restore Cobb's parental rights to his two children. Cobb returned to his home and spun his totem, a metal top, then walked off to play with his kids outside. Since the top was still spinning as the shot faded to black, many viewers took that as a signal that perhaps Perhaps Cobb hadn't finished the job just yet, and there was more to do before he could really reunite with his children in the waking world. Nolan, however, meant to signify something more concrete with the, his ending. He told Princeton University graduates in 2015, the way the end of, the, of that 
film worked. Leonardo DiCaprio's character Cobb, he was off with his kids. He was in his own subjective reality. He didn't really care anymore, and that makes a statement. Perhaps all levels of reality are valid. The camera moves over the spinning top just before it appears to be wobbling. It was cut to black. The idea then is that whether Cobb escaped from his own head or not, his story was done. He was no longer looking for an exit from whatever existence he was in. So there's that. And that's obviously something that um, we are obviously going to be talking about for years to come. And that's pretty much all of Nolan's movies. We, we could always talk about all of those movies, right? We could talk about his Batman movies, you know, uh, Inception, Interstellar, so many different movies that we could talk about the ending and how it could like continue. And I think that the way it ended was so perfect, in my opinion. And to me, it almost begs to wonder, do we really need a sequel uh, to Inception? Nolan's been tied up with other projects. This is very true. Of course, he did uh, he did Dunkirk, and now he's doing Tenet. He's working on other stuff. The cast has been pretty swamped as well, whether you're talking DiCaprio or some of the other, Joseph Gordon-Levitt, Tom Hardy. They're all working on different uh, projects and such. So it's almost like, do we really need, you know, to... Uh, you would want all those characters to come back, or at least the ones that stayed, that, that survived and such, obviously. And then it'd probably be really expensive to make as well. Well, that's pretty obvious, but at the same time, here's the thing. Tenet apparently is like a $250 million project or some, somewhere along those lines. It's a very expensive movie uh, for, uh, you know, to, to make. And apparently it is absolutely incredible um, as far as like visually from what people are saying of this movie. And so... An Inception movie would be really expensive, but it's Christopher Nolan and DiCaprio. I mean, come on, you're going to sell a ton of tickets. Um, I'm pretty sure you're going to make a billion dollars or so on an Inception 2. But uh, that's just my opinion on it. Um, I would love to hear from, from all of you guys regarding Inception, the possibility of an Inception 2. Would you guys want to see a continuation of it? Or are you happy with the way it ended? Because one thing that, that we all love about these, you know, these movies and the movies that Nolan does is that we talk about it. We're still talking about it. We kind of are talking about sequels, but it's almost that we don't need to have a sequel because we could just talk about these movies for years upon years upon years. And that's something, definitely something there that we should absolutely, you know, talk about. And I would love to have a real conversation with all of you guys out there regarding Inception, the possibility of a sequel. Do you want to see a sequel or would you rather just, of course, talk about Inception, the first movie and the only one at this point for the foreseeable future? Let me know what you guys think. Our next topic, guys, is going to be talking a little bit about the Call of Duty League and that being, uh, in particular, the Minnesota launch weekend that happened. And I wanted to talk a little bit about something that happened there, which uh, was really brought to light, uh, obviously, because of the matchup be between the Los Angeles Gorillas and the Minnesota Rocker. The two of them took on each other in the first day of competition, and Basically, the officials of the Call of Duty League took away a game from the Los Angeles Gorillas because one of the members of the LA Gorillas was using Hardline as one of their perks, and you apparently weren't allowed to use that. So, anyways, uh, Aches, the captain of the LA Gorillas, went on social media and really went on a tirade, was really upset about it because basically they're stating that that. Them taking away that game cost them the series against the Minnesota Rocker, which I kind of agree as well. I think that that happened, or it, it definitely seemed um, that that game that was taken from them certainly um, costed them, th them the series. Now, LA Gorillas, they did bring out a statement, so let's get into that. The Los Angeles Gorillas protest the outcome of the lead decision during their Call of Duty League match against the Minnesota Rocker on opening day. While we accept a player did inadvertently use a banned perk, it did not affect the outcome of the game. The Grills accept the loss and will continue to participate in all league competitions and obligations. 
However, enforcement of the violation was inconsistent with prior incidents of similar nature. The allowance of specialist bonuses, despite included banned perks, was decided through an impromptu vote in which no guerrillas team member was invited. The league was mistaken. A gorilla, a guerrillas rep was present. The banned hardline perk is the default perk too on all classes, and the current workaround requires players to refrain from changing their classes pre-match. Relying on players to band aid a flaw in the game is what caused this condition. Several league decisions were cause for additional concern. Competition delays added pressure on the last match of the night, and there is not a written standard regarding time between matches. Team officials were unaware of the penalty until after the match, and league senior leadership was unavailable until pressed to engage with the team. The Grills have no issue with the Minnesota Rocker and appreciate their hospitality and competition this weekend. We hope this action will help the overall competitive integrity of the Call of Duty League and a healthy and fair future for all the franchises involved. So I think this was a really good um, statement. However, what I will say, guys, is that, you know, it says at the very beginning, a player did inadvertently use a ban perk. It did not affect the outcome of the game. Okay, well, that's an opinion. It's hard to say whether or not it would have affected the outcome of the game. Um, I, you know, if he would have not had that perk, you know, what you just never know what could have happened. Obviously, hardline, uh, you don't think that it would have affected the game much, but it, it could have in one way or another. You just will never know unless he didn't have the perk on and we would have seen, would they have had the same outcome? What I will say about this is this. When they took that game away, the LA Gorillas were like deflated. They was almost like they were defeated from it. Like, okay, we worked all so hard to get that first win. And, you know, we were, you know, obviously they would have been up in the series and they it was taken from them. And, you know, the series was tied at that point, but they were like up 2-0 and then it was taken from them. So then it was 1-1 and then they lost the other two. They were so deflated after that. I believe that they certainly would have won the series against the Minnesota Rocker. I don't know if there was, I don't believe there was any foul play, like because Minnesota Rocker was the home team, that there was some kind of, you know, foul play there. It's hard to say. I kind of doubt it. Um, but you, those are things that you got to kind of, you know, keep in mind and kind of look at, you know, you know, because obviously you don't want there to be like cheating or you don't want there to be, you know, anything, you know, suspicious going on in the league. Um, and I think at the very bottom when they said that they hope that the action will help the overall competitive integrity of the Call of Duty League. And I agree with that. I really hope that that's something that, um, you know, I hope this brings to light just, you know, things that are their issues. And look, it's our first year of the Call, the Call of Duty League. So let's see what happens as we move forward. Um, you know, what, what do we do right? What did they do wrong? And what can they do better moving forward? And I think, you know, as they said, several league decisions were cause for additional concern. I mean, that's, that's true as well. I mean, there were things, guys, at the event that there were issues, but it's kind of, it's the first event, right? And, you know, obviously if this is happening for years upon years to come and there's always issues and things of that nature, then there's going to be real cause to, for concern. But with the first year, especially the first event, there's going to be, you know, it's going to take a little while for all the teams to get on the same page and, and things like that. So I would just say that let's just, you know, obviously we got to move forward. Now, this would have been a huge deal if this was like the playoffs or this was like the championships or something like that. This would have been a huge deal and there would have been significant. Uh, I think that it, it would have been completely different. This was like one of the first matches, obviously, of the Call of Duty League. And um, obviously, it's first year, you know, that launch weekend. Happening, happening so early, I think, is good, just so players are very aware of what's going on. The league is not going to tolerate people using banned perks and, you know, guns and, and attachments and things like that. So I think that it was good that it happened, you know, when it happened. But at the same time, I do think that the Gorillas did get robbed of a, of a, of a game against the Rocker. There's a lot more Call of Duty to come, though. A lot more is coming, and that's what's really exciting to me about it. What do you guys think about, you know, what happened between the Rocker and the Gorillas? Do you think it was just? What are your guys' thoughts on it? And do you think that they deserve to have an entire game stripped from them? What do you guys think? Let me know in the comment section below. Our last topic of the day that I want to talk about is 
StarCraft, guys, and, and the question of the day that I'm going to give you guys kind of my thoughts, and then I would love to hear yours, is who is the greatest StarCraft player of all time? The greatest StarCraft player ever to play, and when we talk about StarCraft, we're talking about it as a whole, right? We're talking about StarCraft, we're talking about StarCraft Brew War, we're talking about StarCraft Two, Wings of Liberty, Heart of the Swarm, um, Legacy of the Void, all of it. When you look at all of the greats out there that have played StarCraft, that have played StarCraft II, you can look at all of that. You can see, you know, through the utter domination, the utter, you know, the, the great comebacks, and all of those things kind of make up players. You got to look at the totality of everything, the win-loss ratios, the obviously how many, you know, championships do they have. And when we talk about championships, are we talking the biggest championships, like the BlizzCons of the world? And now, of course, I am Katowice, which is obviously going to be the world championship for, for StarCraft II. Who is the greatest? And I think the way that we have to kind of put those things together is really by separating StarCraft from StarCraft II. And that's kind of our first step in kind of coming up with who's the greatest ever. When I look at it, We'll start with StarCraft, guys. I'm going to give you three from StarCraft and then four from StarCraft 2. So the three from StarCraft, guys, that are my the top of my list from what I've witnessed, from what I've experienced from StarCraft. And obviously, I have a much uh, longer history in StarCraft 2. But with StarCraft in, in particular, I'm looking at Flash, Jadong, and Boxer. Those three absolutely incredible players, guys, winning multiple championships, uh, have, you know, just kind of the amount of time that they were able to go with just winning, you know, winning championships and, and just absolutely playing on, on another level, man. Like these guys, I believe it's actually going to be really hard for any of the StarCraft two players to, you know, even compare to these guys because of the amount of championships, the amount of wins, those win-loss ratios, even though there are certainly guys in StarCraft II that have very good win-loss ratios, but the amount of wins and championships that those three guys have won in StarCraft, in StarCraft Brutal War, um, absolutely unprecedented and just incredible. Like very, um, very difficult to even compete with, right? And... I would say out of those three, when you look at all three of them and you look at the longevity, you look at just everything between those big three, I call them the big three, I'm looking at Flash as the greatest StarCraft player ever um, as far as StarCraft and StarCraft Brood War. Now, Flash did try playing in StarCraft 2. I believe all three of them tried StarCraft 2 at some point or another. Try competing in it, and I, I think all of them just realized that StarCraft 1 was, was their game and the one that they just wanted to continue building their legacy on, and so that's what they did. And it's probably a good idea because Flash has won multiple championships, Jadong, same thing, and Boxer, same thing. It comes down to championships, guys, in a, in a huge way, but also just comes down to that eye test, like who's got the clutch gene, who's got, you know, um, who's able to have those epic comebacks, who's able to... Uh, play very well at the highest level under extreme pressure, at the, the most pressure you could possibly get as a pro player. And Flash, I believe, is that guy. Now let's move over to StarCraft II. When I'm looking at StarCraft II and the history of StarCraft II, there's four guys that I look at that are the greatest ever. I'm looking at Serral, Life, SOS, and Dark. Those four are incredible players, right? And these guys have won championships. They've won, you know, multiple tournaments and things of that nature. But the big one, which is obviously BlizzCon, all of these guys have won once. SOS has won twice. And when I look at all, all four of them, I've always said Life was the greatest StarCraft II player ever. But the match-fixing scandal, which he was involved in, certainly, in my opinion, um, kind of, it almost took him out of the conversation. Because if you are, uh, you know, cheating or, you know, doing uh, something that you're not allowed to be doing, something illegal in the eSport, it's going to tarnish your legacy forever. 
We look at actual traditional sports, and the same can be said there. We can look at tons of different uh, different teams and and you know things that happen like recently with the Houston Astros. I think that their legacies are going to be hurt for a long time or probably forever. At least the, that 2017 team. The New England Patriots, how many times they've been caught cheating and doing very uh, suspicious, you know, malpractices and, and and things of that nature. That is going to tarnish those guys' legacy, whether we want to believe it or not. And life, his legacy has been tarnished forever because we'll never know his full potential or longevity of like where he could have been in StarCraft II or he could still be doing at this very point. He was the greatest I'd ever seen at that in that stretch of time, making it to two BlizzCon finals and winning one of them and then, of course, losing the other. But I got to say, guys, it's, it's very close between those four. It's very close. And I think that we don't have a clear winner at this point because Sarah and Dark are still playing at this point and they're still vying to see where they're at. Like, who's better? Who They're kind of fighting for the greatest of all time in StarCraft 2. So it comes down to, guys, is when you look at all of the players within StarCraft, StarCraft Brew War, and, and StarCraft 2, and all the expansions and all of that, to me, the greatest ever is Flash. He is the greatest StarCraft player at this point of all time. He's the guy, he set the bar, and now everyone else is trying to chase after him. Now, I think before you can catch Flash, you've got to catch Life or you've got to catch SOS. So I think like Serral and Dark, those guys who are still playing, they need to catch SOS. They got to get two championships. And then after that, one of those guys will be considered the greatest. And then from that point, uh, the greatest of StarCraft II. And then you can kind of move forward and trying to catch Flash, which Flash, Jadon, and Boxer, they've put together a resume that is pretty unmatched. It's pretty hard to, to see, uh, you know, someone else catching up to those guys anytime soon. But Cyril is on a great track right now with how early in his career he is. It reminds me of life as far as not obviously with any kind of, you know, scandals, but from the standpoint of how good he is at such a young age and seeing him progress, who knows where Cyril's going to be. If he just keeps going, man, it could be absolutely Remarkable. It could be incredibly, um, it could be unbelievable, guys, where Cyril could could end up as far as championships are concerned. And obviously, though, it's the big one. It's the Super Bowl of of, of, of StarCraft is what you have to look at. That being I am Katowice now in 2021, which is what all of those guys are going to be chasing after and trying to, to, trying to get and win. But I would love to hear from all of you. What's your list of the greatest players of all time in StarCraft and then in StarCraft 2? And then who do you think is the greatest ever? My guy is Flash at this point, and I'm sure I'll probably update this list over time. Might even update it later on this year, depending. But this has been my list now for a while. And I've always thought of, you know, uh, Flash Boxer, Jadong. I mean, those guys are just, uh, just un unbelievable players. And then you got the big three in StarCraft II, uh, that being, you know, Serral, Life, and, and Dark. And then SOS is kind of, you know, obviously won more championships, which you have to put that somewhere, even though I don't think SOS was quite as good of a player as any three of those, you know, Life or uh, or Dark or Serral. I don't think he was quite as good or he didn't have, you know, quite the longevity I didn't feel, but he still was incredible and one of the greatest ever in StarCraft II, and there's no debating that. So... I'm going to pass the question on to you guys. What do you guys think? Who is the greatest all time in StarCraft and in StarCraft 2? And who would you take as far as the greatest ever that StarCraft has to offer in the esports realm? Let me know what you guys think. I would love to have a conversation about it. And with that being said, everyone, I hope you guys did enjoy this episode of The 8 Below Show. And if you guys did, leave a thumbs up, subscribe if you're new, stay positive. And as always, I'll talk to you guys all in the next one. Peace.